All right, I hope you don't mind. We're going to record this session because three o'clock on a Wednesday, and I'm certain not everyone can make it that wants to. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Erica Offerdahl. I'm director of the Transformational Change Initiative, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to today's pit stop. Um, this pit stop is co-sponsored by the Transformational Change Initiative, as well as the Teaching Academy. And I'd like to just give a little bit of background about um, why I'm so excited to be hosting this session. Um, I, as well as Teresa Jordan and Kathleen Cohen and many others on this call actually are members of the WSU Teaching Academy. And during our spring retreat, um, Teresa and Kathleen presented some of their work that they've been doing as part of their membership in the Teaching Academy. Importantly, these two have spearheaded the piloting of a co-mentoring and observation program that's really designed to help connect faculty to think deeply about their teaching, to partner together as, as scholars and um, friendly crit critiques of one another to advance their thinking about teaching and their teaching practice. Um, when they shared the program that they had designed and pilot tested, and I saw just what fabulous potential this has for our faculty at WSU, I couldn't resist. Um, and so I reached out to Teresa and Kathleen as director of TCI and asked them if they thought that this was a program that could be scaled uh, system-wide to any faculty member who's interested and they said yes. So um, we're embarking on a three year pilot for this project and I really wanted Teresa and Kathleen to share with you what they have planned, what the benefits are, how it works and um, get some interest from you all in perhaps participating if not this year, then sometime in the upcoming years. So I'd like to introduce um, both Kathleen and Teresa and then I'll leave the floor to them I'm gonna uh, sit back and be moderator. I'll be watching the chat for questions, although we'll try and hold questions perhaps till the end, unless they're, we're just dying. And um, so Kathleen Cowan is an associate professor in, the, um, in educational leadership, and she's joining us from Tri-Cities campus. And Teresa Jordan uh, is a professor in history. She's joining us from Pullman campus. She is telling me that um, her internet is not behaving well today. So she may be dropping in and out. And, and so please be patient as the, hopefully the internet gods will start to behave a little bit more in her favor. So with no further ado, Kathleen and Teresa, um, please tell us about this program that's available for all WSU faculty. Well, thank you very much, Erica, for that lovely introduction. And what I've done is uh, Teresa and I've prepared a, a PowerPoint. So would that be appropriate to start right now? All right, just wanted to check in. Um, and then I saw that Teresa is there, but she's logging out. So, okay, all right. I'm keeping an eye on my partner there. So um, just wanna uh, share get this going. Oh, for heaven's sakes, what's happening? Share screen. Here it is. Let's go from the beginning. Oh, what is it doing? I don't understand. Oh, there. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, and Teresa and I are just really excited to uh, share this program with you. And, uh, but before we get started, uh, we would like to just take a moment and think about our space and our place. And so uh, Teresa and I would like to um, acknowledge with deep respect that Washington State University Tri-Cities is located on the shared traditional homelands of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla and the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation. Kathleen, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, it may work. And I'd like to say for the Pullman campus that the Washington State University here at Pullman 
is located on the lands of the Nipu tribe and the Palouse people. We acknowledge their presence here since time immemorial and recognize their continuing connection to the land, to the water, and to their ancestors. So, thank you for joining us today. And we're really excited that, um, that you want to find out more about our pilot program that's going forward on peer mentoring and co and on peer observation and co-mentoring. And what we're really seeking to do is to create a community of partners who really want to know more about their own teaching practices and be able to explore that in a safe and very supportive place. Um, we're also going to learn um, in the orientation, I'll share a bit today, but we'll learn more about some um, research-based practices for um, looking at the improvement of teaching and learning, and not just teaching and learning for ourselves, but also for our students. And then we also really uh, want to create a community where we can come together and really um, reflect and learn from each other. So that's the why of the program. Um, and to be able to create the kind of community that we're really looking for is um, the number one thing is we really do need to take some time to think about how we're going to work together and how we're going to be together. So what we did at the beginning of establishing our community, and these are norms that we created over the past two years. And of course we would be open to new norms and, um, and asking each participant to affirm these norms, um, is that we're really looking to, um, of course, always be kind and caring and supportive so that we truly have a safe space. And to do this, what I have found in my years of teaching is that there's one practice that really is helpful. And that is this idea of attentive listening. And attentive listening can be kind of countercultural in today's world um, because it takes time and it takes uh, really putting other first. And so attentive listening is this idea that you're listening so carefully, you could repeat back what the other person says. So it's not an idea about thinking about what you want to say next, but really deeply listening to your partner and to our, our community members. So we're really going to put forward that as a number one um, norm um, after kind, caring, and supportive. But we're also going to think about how we can use inquiry, how we can use questions to help um, each other stretch our thinking about um, our teaching practices. And also we're going to turn to wonder. And what that means is that when something comes up for you in something you're seeing or something you're doing, we want you to be really um, within yourself, be reflective and be thoughtful about why that's happening and even why maybe those feelings are coming up for you. And another norm that I just really love is that um, the norm about teaching is messy. And, you know, we really talked about this over the past two years in our um, formation of the norms and this idea that um, we're in the people business and um, we, we, we can't always be in control of what other people do and how things go. So we, we want to just acknowledge that things sometimes will go great and sometimes maybe not quite the way we anticipated, but that that also leaves a space for innovation and creativity and new ideas to, to bloom, to, uh, to come to fruition. And we really want to underscore that the process that we're talking about in terms of peer observation 
and co-mentoring is not a high stakes evaluative approach, that this is very much about deep reflection and growing in our own practice. So we would um, encourage at, the, um, at, at our first orientation for those of you that want to come along on this journey to affirm these norms and then, of course, be open to hearing other norms that you think we might need to add. So these norms are really critical to the formation of that community that we're looking to create. And so um, now to sort of the model of what we're doing. And uh, the peer observation model that we're using comes from the work of uh, Sullivan and Glanz. And uh, it really has these four components. And the four components uh, are that you have the planning conference, which is um, another way to say that is the pre-observation meeting. And then, of course, you complete the observation. And what we're thinking about is uh, an entire lesson, an entire class, or if you teach a class that goes for multiple hours, then maybe some segment of that lesson. And then the third component is the feedback conference, or that meeting you have following the observation. And then the fourth component which often is um, not included in the process, some folks have experienced, um, is this idea of being together um, and reflecting, and reflecting not just on that feedback, but on the entire process. So we call that the collaborative reflection, and that happens after the feedback conference. And so um, this next slide, I, I, I have this uh, as a placeholder here because I, I want to share the next slide and we will definitely go into much more detail at the orientation. So um, just know that. Um, but I also want you to sort of fasten your seatbelt because there are 24 uh, components that go into um, completing the the entire four components of this model. And, um, and so I'm going to show you a slide now that is really dense. So um, don't worry if you can't read it. I'm, I have broken it out into the four components. But I also wanted you to see uh, the entirety of what will be going over at the orientation so that you can be best prepared to, to work through all the parts of the process. So so here's the form, and yes, um, 24 things, but what I want to share is that um, a lot of these things can be um, completed uh, at the pre-observation meeting or at that planning meeting. And one of the pieces that I'd really like to talk about is that at the pre-observation meeting, um, you will have um, this time to, um, to just go through, put your calendars together, and set the dates and times and location for the pre-observation meeting, for the actual observation, and for the time that you will um, send your observation notes and um, information to your uh, partner, and then uh, time for the collaborative reflection. So a lot of that form gets filled in at this pre-observation meeting. But you need to come to the pre-observation meeting with a goal in mind. So the kind of observation we're looking for is the person being observed sets the goal. They, um, they tell the observer what they want them to watch for. And so we use this process uh, called a SMART goal um, to really think about, you know, just focusing in on what the one thing is you want the observer to really focus on. So we use um, this acronym SMART for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. The next thing that you need to come to this pre-observation meeting thinking ahead about is the idea of once you have your goal, then what kind of data do you need to collect? 
And so at this pre-observation meeting, you'll want to take time to, uh, to work together to create the kind of tool or observation recording form or data collection form um, to collect the kind of data that goes hand in hand with your goal. And then um, I always recommend at a uh, at the pre-observation conference that we we go back to the work of Sullivan and Glanz and we really look at those ten guidelines for observation. And I'll talk a bit about those in a minute or two. And then um, also it's important to you know talk about the techniques or strategies that you're going to use in the class, and then set the time and date for the observation, and then set the time and date for those observational notes that the person who's doing the observation will send to the observee. Um, and you wanna have that post-meeting also set up. So these are really important pieces to have done at that pre-observation meeting. And then the actual observation um, all of the items will have been completed on this portion, except for item 17. And that's where the meat of the, of the observation happens for the observer. And so this is um, how the observer will um, take all the information down on the data collection. So say your goal was to increase uh, participation by students in, um, in small group work. And so what the observer might set up their tool for is um, they might have a drawing of the, of the classroom setup and the, the number of projected students in each group. And so there may be a way for the observer to collect data on how many student interactions were happening at each table, which students did not interact um, in the group work. And so this would be the data that would be shared with the person who had been observed. So ahead of time, ahead of that pre, uh, ahead of that post observation conference or the feedback conference, so they have time to reflect and make some notes themselves. And then uh, part three, that component three, is the feedback conference, the meeting that you have after the observation is completed. And again, what's going to hap happen here is that you'll have, as the observer, have sent your notes to the person who was observed so they can think about it and um, make their own notes and, um, and then uh, collect any other reflections that you have at that conference. Uh, you, you're going over the notes, you're thinking about it, and then you're also making notes in the minute, in the, in the time it's happening. And then finally, at the very end of the feedback conference, we want you to shift into a mode called collaborative reflection. And this is where both the observee shares their reflection on the entire process and the observer shares their reflections on the entire process. And this is really important to talk about what worked well, what could be changed and you know what was important what was of value because if you as you go into your next observation cycle you want to pull those threads you want to bring those pieces along and so uh Again, just to recap, there's there. It looks like a lot, um, but there's some key components again that we'll highlight at, when we have a little longer to talk at the orientation. Um, but um, just keep in mind that uh, we have a process, and then we also have um, during the orientation we'll talk about like what that might look. Like you know, some, some sentence starters for how you might have those um, discussions at various points like the feedback conference. And so our goal for the program is for uh, that one observation cycle to be uh, this, it works this way, person A observes person B, then person B observes person A. And that's our, um, our, our goal is to have completed two of those observation cycles 
using all four components um, um, this semester. So that's, that's our hope, our goal. And so I think one of the things that you might be thinking about is, okay, what kind of time commitment does it take to do these 24 things? Um, and so uh, when you work ahead, when you have your goal ahead of time, um, it's really um, pretty easy to get that planning conference squared away because once you have the goal, then you know how you might record the data um, and uh, you can put your calendars together and, um, and get that done. And you might not even have to meet um, in person. Those things could be shared um, over, uh, over email. And we're, um, we're thinking about 15 minutes for that uh, pre-observation or planning conference to happen. And then we're really hoping that uh, it would be an entire class session. So we just put 60 minutes there. We know some classes are shorter, some classes are longer, but we're looking for a whole class observation. And then it, you, this next part is a part of the feedback conference. Uh, you want the person who did the observing to take time to put their notes together and get them ready to be sent to the, um, uh, the uh, person who was observed. And that takes about 30 minutes. You'll have, um, you know, you'll have your notes that you take in the moment, but you might want to uh, clean them up a bit and tidy them up a bit and then send them off uh, via email to the person who was observed. And then the really important 30 minutes is that uh, you get together and really talk about those notes and um, and make some more notes and, and, and talk about what you learned, what you might do differently, what you want to do again. And so we're allowing about 30 minutes for the feedback conference. And then at the end of the feedback conference, you want to take that time to reflect together about the process. So we've put 15 minutes there. So yes, it's a two and a half hour commitment for one observation cycle per participant. And we really believe that um, this can get faster as the relationship between the partners grows. And once you have done it a, a time or two, it can get faster and faster. So um, next is uh, what we want you to have our support. Teresa and I wanna be of support. And so what we've planned are some debrief sessions where we would meet as a whole group um, after you complete the first cycle and then um, of observing A and observing B and B observing A. And then uh, we, we think those could last 30 minutes, but uh, you know that's our estimated time depending on what the participants want to talk about and what questions you might have. And we also are very open to feedback and, and learning from each time that we do this with a group. So um, we've planned a debrief session for November 16th. And then there would be another opportunity between November um, 16th and December 14th to complete another cycle of observation. And then on December 14th, we would have another debrief session. So that's what we're planning. And that debrief session time is really your time to talk with us about what your learnings were and for all of us to learn together from what you learned. And so the fall semester schedule looks something like this. Um, we're hoping to have the orientation on October 12th, starting at 10 a.m. And um, then between that orientation, you would um, meet with your partner and complete that first observation cycle. And then we would have that uh, full group debrief on November 16th. And then um, uh, we would meet uh, we would have a, a time between November 16th and December 14th for you to complete another cycle of observations. And then we would have another full group debrief on December 14th. So what I'd like to do now is just give you a little taste of some of the research-based scholarship that undergirds uh, 
the the program that we've developed. And again, this is just um, you know a, a snippet uh, of of the scholarship, but I, I want you to um, to to know that we'll talk more about it at the orientation. So the first thing that really um, goes along with the, the model that with the four components that we're using is uh, again from the work of Sullivan and Glanz. And this has to do with uh, the 10 guidelines of observation. And uh, I really uh, found in my own practice that when I was doing a peer observation of a partner um, that it was really important to sit with this and think about this before I conducted um, an observation. And in fact, I, I carried this, um, this model in my portfolio that I would take to go um, and take my notes uh, on the tool that uh, we had co-created. And so it's really important. Um, these are this, this is really important to think about when you conduct an observation. There, there's actual guidelines for how to do that. And um, the number one thing is that uh, you really need to be uh, thoughtful and reflective and, and have that discussion with your partner that's going to do the observation. You need to take time. And that's why, um, you know, the planning conference is so important. And, you know, it's really important for the person who's being observed to, you know, to really talk about their classroom practice, to kind of make you feel like you know what's going on in their classroom and, you know, uh, what, what, what their objectives for the class are. It's really important to also always think about your observation notes from the perspective of description. You want to be sure you're describing what you saw, what you observed, and um, and not uh, as uh, we we see here in number four, uh, interpret uh, what what the what you saw. And again, um, as part of the planning conference, it's really important to once you have that goal to decide how best to capture the data that you're looking for to learn more about um, whether you accomplished your goal or not. And then um, it, we always wanna be thoughtful and, um, and, and really think about our own personal bias that can come into completing an observation. Maybe that's not the way we would do it in our classroom, but I think it's really important to be open and to be thoughtful as you approach an observation so that you're really thinking about this from the perspective of describing of the, the events that you saw take place as they relate to the goal that the person being observed has set. And so again, it's this idea of just separating interpretation from description. And it's really important that we're not trying to observe 10 things. The, the, the guidelines are to observe one thing. And, um, and then, you know, you want to discuss how you're going to, you know, where you're going to sit and, and, and where you're going to, you know, how you, if you should move around the classroom, if you should be engaged with the students, you'll learn that information when you discuss the goal. And then a key guideline that really I want to share is that you really should not have any conclusions based on just one observation. Um, those conclusions should always be based on multiple observations. So this set of 10 guidelines is something as a part of the planning conference that I will want you as partners to think about as you, um, as you uh, move forward in the process. And then another piece of scholarship that I really want you to think about is this work from Drago Severson and Bloom De Stefano. And uh, this uh, framework is really important to help us think about how we um, like to give feedback and then how we like to receive feedback. One of the most important things is that it you can have this wonderful uh, data collection. You can have uh, reflections and notes to share with your partner. But if they can't receive that information, 
um, in a way that makes meaning for them, then it, you know th this isn't going to work. We've got to we've got to really take time to think about our own way of giving and our own way of receiving feedback. And so we'll talk a little bit more at the um, at the orientation about about this framework. But for example, if you are a person who likes to give really direct feedback, like you like it right between the eyes, you you want to know exactly what you should do differently, and um, that's how you like to give feedback, and you give feedback in that manner to someone who really is more self-authoring, say. They, they like to really, um, you know, to get that feedback in a way that they can discuss your ideas, but develop their own goals based on what you told them, then there's going to be a mix, uh, a, a, a mix up in terms of the benefit of that feedback. So we're going to do a little um, do a little work in terms of discovering more about our own way of um, giving feedback and receiving feedback so that when we work with our partner we can have that conversation up front like how do you like to get the feedback and so that the feedback can be received in the best way possible to give the most opportunity for um, improvement of teaching and learning for our students. And then um, we're also going to draw from the literature uh, about mentorship and co-mentorship, because we're really wanting to develop a relationship with our partner where we can really be open about our practice. Again, remember, this is not a high stakes evaluative process. This is about improving teaching and learning. It's about learning more about our own practice and ways that we can improve our practice. And so we'll talk about how to have that conversation as a part of the feedback conference. And it's really important uh, to understand from Zachary and Fischler's model that there are different levels of communication, different levels of conversation. Um, right now, I'm in level one monologue. I'm talking at you. Um, and um, maybe here in the questions and answers, we'll, we'll move into transition, um, uh, sorry, transaction or interaction. Um, and so in your conversations with your partner, you'll move throughout the levels because when you set up the dates and times and places, you'll definitely be in interaction level. And when we get to the feedback conference, what we really are hoping for uh, is this reaching this level of conversation that Zachary and Fischler call collaborative engagement. And in a collaborative engagement level conversation, we're really able to learn from one another. We're using an inquiry approach. We're using questioning approaches um, in discussion. And we can be vulnerable. We can say, oh my gosh, that didn't work the way I thought it was going to work. Um, or, um, you know, you can say, well, you know, I, I've had a situation similar to that, and, and, and so I know just how you feel. Um, but let me tell you what I what I think might might help, or something that I, worked for me. And so uh, we want to get to that level where we can be really vulnerable with each other and be open about our practice. Now, a level five conversation doesn't happen every day, um, at, but when it does, you know it because. What happens in a level five conversation that Zachary and Fischler called dialogue is that um, that state of really deep, attentive listening. And you're not trying to set each other straight or change each other's thinking. You're really listening in such a deep way that you can help the person speaking learn maybe a new, something new from what they're expressing. And so uh, 
there could be moments in your co-mentoring conversations, especially um, talking about practice, where we can reach into a dialogue level conversation. So um, one more piece of scholarship that I wanna highlight is from the work of Costa and Kalik. And this is a sort of foundational article that um, comes from a process uh, call uh, that is part of the 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 model so the Sullivan and Glanz model uh, for improving teaching and learning those four components it models that uh, beautifully um, and but sometimes people are put off by the the word critical in the title and so um, just bear with me and know that um, it, it's not the kind of critical that you might be thinking but it's a, a type of um, a type of relationship and a type of work where uh, again the the critical friend number one critical friend uh, describes what they want help on what they want to work on and they tell you straight out i want some feedback on this please can you help me and then critical friend two asks some questions and clarifies to be sure they know exactly what critical friend one wants and uh, it's always important that critical friend one is setting the outcome and then critical friend two provides to the best of their ability that feedback. And it's always about the feedback, trying to elevate the work. It's not about tearing down kind of critical. It's about elevating the work. And then again, just like in the Solden and Glanz model, we're reflecting again, both critical friends reflect. So we're going to layer the critical friends and the model for improving teaching and learning together along with this idea from Drago Severson and Bloom De Stefano about ways of knowing and how our individual ways of knowing um, interact with how we give and receive feedback. And then we're also going to think about our levels of conversation. So those are some of the pieces of scholarship that really um, are undergirding this program. And there's more, but those are the ones we had time for today. Um, and so um, I just really uh, wanted to leave time for questions because I know this is um, a, maybe a new model to folks. Uh, and, and so, uh, but I also would just like to, um, to thank all of our participants for the from the past two years of the pilot, and um, I have their names right here. And one of those uh, participants is my partner in all of this, Teresa Jordan. And so I asked Teresa at this time to just share a little bit uh, about her experiences and even using those questions that we, we always use in our collaborative reflection. So Teresa, I'll give it over to you now. Thank you, Kathleen. It's been a real pleasure to work with Kathleen over the past two years, and I appreciate her, her kindness, her tolerance, her ability to want to make things better. And it's both a process of learning how to interact with our peers, our colleagues, our students, and it's about improving our teaching. And improving our teaching can be something that we can do for the individual classroom, for the course, and it can, if we choose to have it do so, it can be part of our teaching portfolio. But that's our choice. If we decide this is something we want to include in our portfolio, good. Totally up to us. So I worked with Kara Whitman in the School of the Environment, and we were working on, on different aspects of our teaching. And we both, again, got to choose what it was we wanted to focus on, observing one another in our classes, talking about it later. Uh, and so it had an impact on our personal relationship. We're friends. We became better friends. I know I have a colleague out there I can rely on. That's a great feeling. And it helped us improve our teaching in those you know, specific courses. And then, as it turned out, Kara was all of a sudden up for a promotion. This came up really quickly 
And she was able to ask me, could you submit a teaching evaluation for me, for my file? Sure, I can do that. I've got my notes. So these say, there's a great deal of flexibility in the program that it can do what we want it to do. And of all the people that you see there, one of the things I really like about this is that we're cross-disciplinary. And that works really well. Uh, this is about teaching, not being specialists in, in a field. And it, I think it really helped everyone that we came from different areas because we weren't worried about what were they thinking about, what I think about this, that, or the other thing. It's about teaching and how effective am I being in achieving my objectives. We can all help each other do that. So this has been really a transformational process for me. I've done, uh, I've had people come in to do class observations so it can go in my promotion file. Then yes, we can do that with this. But I think even more importantly, we don't have to do that with this. And this can be about helping each other become the teachers we want to be. That's the most important part for me. Back to you, Kathleen. Thank you so much, Teresa. So that's the end of the PowerPoint. These are our email and we really want to model being open to your questions, comments and feedback. So I'll uh, stop sharing now, Erica, unless someone needed to see a slide again and then I will um, we'll be open for questions. And I'm looking up and down my Hollywood squares here to see if anybody wants to see us, has their hand up and wants a slide and looking at my chat. So seeing none, I'll stop sharing. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your attention. Thank you to Kathleen and Theresa. Any questions, comments, concerns? I have a question. Hi there, this is I'm Katie Forsyth um, in the Department of Human Development on the Pullman campus. And you listed um, uh, the dates, the timeline for fall term. And I my understanding is this is a long-term program, but maybe it's also in a pilot phase. So, so the question is, uh, will you have a similar structure or outline for spring term? Or are you really just focusing on fall term at this point? How is, what is, that planning look like and future timelines look like? Kathleen, you wanna share those dates? Well, Teresa and I uh, proposed some potential dates of having um, the orientation for the spring semester start on February 1st. And then we have uh, some dates for the debriefs of uh, March 7th and April 18th. That's what works with our teaching schedule. But I, um, Erica, we can we can work together if there's anything else that we you know need to know. We we put our heads together and thought those might again mirror that four to five weeks taking into account the um, university holidays and um, and trying to give folks at you know, four weeks or so to complete the cycle of observation before each debrief. Right, thank you. Even just knowing that you have a structure, whether, you know, not even needing to know the, the specific details, the, the note that uh, there will be something planned for the spring is nice to know. So thank you very much. Well, we're hoping so. <laughs> well, okay, good, thanks. Yeah, Katie, you're right. We're, this is a year one of, further piloting slash scaling up. And so I know that Kathleen and Teresa are going to be really responsive to feedback, including when these things should be offered. <laughs> so we may, we might find that there needs to be greater flexibility and, and we'll work that way if needed. It's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, there's a question in the Q and A. Um, it says, thank you very much for the workshop. Very useful. Are there similar trainings for department chairs? I believe they are required to do observation for some units. That's a great, I, so I think I can say 
very quickly, no, there's not. But I'd like to put, pose the question to Teresa and Kathleen, how might this program be adapted for department chairs? That is a great question, Erica. And it, it should really, you know, we, be something that our higher ups are included in, in the conversation. I would love to have our chairs be part of this because I see this as something which again, transforms the culture here at the university. And instead of looking at this as something which is a one and done, looking at it as something which is a progression and that we work together as colleagues, not just to go in and observe a class, but to go in and see, oh, this looks really good and where can I help you? And what are you working toward? And so, yes, I'd love to have our chairs be part of this process to help them see observations really being peer mentoring instead of just a one and done observation. And that really is undergirded by the scholarship <laughs> and about, uh, about peer observation. And you saw, uh, I, I took a little bit of extra time, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about those 10 guidelines for observation. And it's really important because there was one on there that said it shouldn't ever just be one observation, right? And so um, that's not the spirit of, of, of the model that solving guns have put forth with those four components. So um, we, we definitely would want um, to think about those 10 guidelines. And so I would welcome, as Teresa said, those uh, department chairs to come and hear uh, about this, um, you know, I'm I'm the College of Ed, so you know uh, we we have some expertise in this, and I see my my uh, my department uh, chair there. Um, yeah, so hi, Tammy. Any other questions or comments for our presenters today? Well, if you have a colleague that's interested, um, as soon as this video processes, it'll be posted on the TCI um, YouTube channel. It'll also be on the Pit Stop uh, webpage, so you can share it with them. And I believe the registration is live. So if you're interested in participating this semester, sign up. Um, I also, Teresa, Kathleen, would it be appropriate for people who are interested in spring to maybe somehow put that into the fall registration so that we could contact those folks and, um, you know, in late December and see if the timeline for spring works for them. That's a good idea, Erica. We should do that. Okay. Um, I might, I think I might add that information to the web so folks know that they can do that. So Katie, if you are interested in spring or you have a colleague that is, that might be a way for us to be more flexible and responsive to the schedules of folks moving forward. And, right. you know, one of the things I know we're ending a little early, Erica, but one of the things that I always try to model is leaving time for feedback. So I would be really open um, for anyone here to give me some public feedback. I, I just really believe in that. So that's why I always try to leave time uh, for feedback or ideas. So please, uh, maybe uh, I know that we're um, that we're coming up with about eight minutes to go, but um, I'm open to feedback. So please. I believe leaders ask for feedback, and so I want to model that. Oh, come on, you have some feedback for me. <laughs> sure, I'll throw one out there. Um, this has been great. I was, you know, looking ahead, it seems like the Thursday, uh, Thursday at 10 a.m. is consistent, and for someone who can never make that happen, it'll just never happen, especially okay. when it comes to teachers, folks who, because this is so focused on the teaching practice, that if one has class consistently at that time, it just, that would, feels like a, a limitation. So um, okay. of course, not wanting to put more on your plates by having two rounds of orientations, that's not what I'm suggesting, but maybe um, some creative solution to how someone can access that if they can't attend live. Okay. That's really good feedback. We
we knew that might happen, but we we had to pick a date, you know, and between the two of our our schedules, it's tricky. Am I right in reading that there's only a certain number of uh, people, 10 or something like that, or 10 pairs or something that you're taking each semester? So what if you've got 30, 40 people interested? We'll have to get creative about how we're going to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I'm going to tell more people, or maybe I won't, so I can make sure I'm one of the 10. <laughs> <laughs> and and Cameron, you know, my I'm, that's a great question. And Katie, your comment is was really good too. My hope would be that by the time we've run this for a few semesters, that we'll have people that are so excited about this program that they will want to become mini Kathleen and Teresa's and perhaps help with the orientation and training so that we could build capacity. Or heck, full-fledged Kathleen and Teresa's. I, 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 you know, that'd be great too. <laughs> have a comment and first yeah. of all thank you Catherine Tr Teresa great presentation great workshop um so while I I was at Central Washington University for three years um I was their faculty fellow for excellence in teaching and learning so I hosted programs that train fac train faculty on how to teach and also do peer observation uh maybe you you guys already have this um for the peer observation and, and also teaching part, we have a, kind of like a faculty get book or handbook. Um, I think your presentation is great. The recording is going to be really useful. But for someone who may not have the time to go through the recording, maybe a, a, a handbook um, could be really helpful to help them navigate into specific sections and then provide um, examples or uh, uh, example forms or for evaluation. I think those kind of things can be very helpful um, and it can be helpful for faculties and, and even for chairs to adopt them and use them uh, if, if that can be developed or drafted. We're, we're, thank you so much for that feedback. We're, we've, we're in the process of developing pieces that would be shared like that at the, uh, at the orientation. Um, in fact, once we know who's uh, planning on coming to the orientation, we can send those out ahead so that they, folks can look at them. Um, and, but we, we haven't actually made a handbook yet. So that, that, um, yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a future to do maybe. <laughs> Thank you. So what I've been doing, Erica, is trying to practice some wait time, you know, because some people are um, are thinkers and they need to, time to process their question. And so um, I know we're getting down to the last four minutes. So if anyone else has a comment, I please invite you to share or a question? Uh, I also think uh, examples are really helpful. Um, and if any faculty is willing to provide their documents as examples, I think that can be really helpful. Uh, and, you know, I, I wish everyone has the time to participate in into this. But unfortunately, <laughs> everyone is super busy. Uh, so um, as, as much as we, like faculty, like we can learn and, and, uh, and use those examples, uh, I think it will be very helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we may have all our questions and comments. I think I I don't think I ever step my bounds by saying if you come up with a question, suggestion, feedback, you can email Kathleen or Teresa. 
I'm happy to receive an email and pass on anonymous feedback if that is what your preference is. Um, but I really appreciate you taking the time today with be with us. And thank you to Kathleen and Teresa. This is an amazing opportunity you're providing for our community. Have a wonderful rest of the week, everyone.